the social and political meaning of breeding, even the word breeding itself, is all very uncomfortable. It is a question that is deeply painful to mankind at all times, and that therefore has been treated by both religious and great philosophers with circumspection and reserve. But it is a subject especially unpleasant to us moderns. It touches on many things modern people thought had been settled or best no longer talked about. It is a question almost identical to the question of human superiority and inferiority. It is easy to see that this is so from two points of view, the classical and the modern. From the classical point of view, once one accepts the necessity of this question of the centrality of human breeding, for example, as the founder of a political state, or the founder of a religion, or as a lawgiver, it becomes intimately tied with the second. For it is of greatest importance which qualities a wife also selects for in a husband. What types of men are rewarded and given chance to have a posterity? It concerns the next generation of citizens or subjects. How they are to be raised, provided for, educated, what kinds of men and women they are to become, but most importantly, who is to be born. Many ancient traditions assumed that human pairings are not, or should not be, random. They assumed, unconsciously or not, the hereditary nature of various qualities, and therefore assumed that great care must go into matchmaking. In political philosophy, starting with the Greeks, this question becomes explicit. A point of view like that, implied in John Rawls' veil of ignorance, or any idea of accident of birth, would have seemed absurd for the simple reason that neither marriages nor births are random or incidental. Indeed, both men and women, and in the classical case, governments, put the greatest care in this question, above all.